feel like I got a word. So if you're tuning in, I want you to know that you are tuning in to faith, to hope, and to love. It's the greatest. Faith, because it's greater than doubt. I know everybody's posting, you know, faith over fear. The opposite of fear is not faith. The opposite of fear is courage. The opposite of faith is doubt and disbelief. So you're turning into faith right now. We believe God is either going to cure people or they're going to find a cure. Because that's the type of God I serve. You're tuning into hope because if you didn't have hope, why go on? Why go on living if you ain't got no hope? What do they say? You can live three minutes without oxygen or three days without water, whatever it is, but you can only live three seconds without hope. So we need hope. And then love. You know what this virus ain't going to stop us from doing? Loving people. We're going to love people because that's what God has called us to do. Open your Bibles, if you wouldn't mind, to the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 11. I want to talk to you a little bit about some family business. And uh, I just want to read this passage of text with you. Out of the NIV version, if you don't have that, uh, it'll be up on the board. First Chronicles chapter 11. It says, after him, now notice we're going to get into some hard names. So if I make it up as I go along, you'll never know the difference. After him, Eleazar, the son of Dodo, which is a popular boy's name right now. <laughs> Feel free to use it anytime you want. Is that the name of your next child right there, Dodo? Okay, just asking. The, Af- the Afuite, who was one of the three mighty men, he was with David as Pasadimim. Now there the Philistines were gathered for a battle. Now watch this. And there was a piece of ground full of barley. Picture a, a wheat field. So the people fled from the Philistines. But they, who, Eleazar and, and the mighty men, stationed themselves in the middle of that field, and what did they do? Defend it. And they killed the Philistines, so they brought the, they, the Lord brought about a great, what? Victory. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, I thank you for everything you're doing right here in this place. I thank you, Lord, that there is a stirring in America right now. There's already been a call to prayer, but now there's a call to faith. There's a call to believing that God is going to do something in the midst of this. So, Lord, we trust Father, it's my prayer. As you speak to me, speak through me for the blessing and benefit of your people. In Jesus' name, and we all said, Amen. thank you, Becca. Thank you, worship team. That was awesome. So we see this story, and in the midst of the story, we see that there was a group of men who finally decided they were no longer going to retreat. We saw a group of people who said, listen, I'm tired of running. I'm tired of tucking tail. I'm tired of allowing the enemy to advance. Sooner or later, we'll have to draw a line in the sand. And I'm not, I'm not uh, doubting what is taking place. I am not, you know, living with my head in the sand, you know, so to say. But I'm drawing a line. I'm drawing a line because as a believer, I think there comes a time when you have to draw the line. And you have to research for yourself. You have to educate yourself. And then there's things that you need to do. But I'm drawing a line. As a pastor, I'm drawing the line. And I've chosen this field on where to die. Because God has never called the church to live in fear and to live in doubt. We have, we, hey, listen, the church has been through pandemics, epidemics, tyrants. It has, stood, it has stood against world leaders, and it has always prevailed, and this will be no different. This will be no different. I don't care what you watch or who you listen to. This will be no different. As a believer, you should love more what's to come than more than what's right here. It's the bottom line. Now watch this. I love what they said. They said one leader got up, Eleazar, and he said, listen, I'm tired of running. I see a plot of, and I see a plot of land. I'm going to take my sword out of my sheath, and I'm going to fight right here. And so I've decided that I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand as your ambassador against this virus. I'm going to stand against the fear. I'm going to stand against the panic that is plaguing our society right now where folks can't get a two-ply roll of toilet paper. Napkins, y'all. Napkins. How many times how must I remind you of the hood ways? Napkins. Okay. Now, here's the deal. As I read my Bible, it has not changed. Jesus is not in the tomb. He still conquered death, hell, and the grave. So there is hope for us. So what do we need to do, pastor? Well, first off, you got to use sense and sensibility. Common sense. I love now how folks want to wash their hands. You should have been washing your hands every day, all day anyway. 
I'm just throwing that out there. Hello? Hello? I mean, I will go no further. I'm sorry. I just, I got nothing but funny thoughts in my head. And here's what we need to remind ourselves up on the board. And I am convinced that, what was that word? Look at your neighbor and tell him. Oh, that was weak. Look at your second choice. Say nothing. He said, I am convinced that nothing can what? Ever, 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 ever separates you from the God's love, neither death nor life, angels or demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Why the world might be in a panic, may the world find the church. May the world find the church living life. You know, listen, how about this for a thought? If the virus is going to find you and it's going to jump on you, then maybe it'll find you praying. Maybe it'll find you loving. Maybe it'll find you reading. Maybe it'll even find you fasting. But I can tell you this much, if it finds me, it'll find me doing what God has called me to do since the beginning of when he saved my soul, which is preaching the gospel. The church doesn't retreat. We advance. We advance. We advance. Why? Because nothing can separate us. If you read your Bible and you study church history, whenever a plague broke out, it was the church that moved in. If you go back and you study it, who do you think the nurses were? They were nuns. They were nuns, literally nuns, who went in and said, I love what's coming more than I love what's here. So let me take care of you. So let me take care of you. Let me show you the church. And then God gives us a supernatural ability to love and lead well. So this is what it can find us doing. Why? Because nothing is going to separate us from what God wants to do. Why? Because he says, God has not given you a spirit of what? So why freak out? Why freak out? Why freak out? But he's given you love, peace, and a what? A sound mind. Sound mind. I just ran into somebody today. They introduced me to their, to their uh, I think it was their nephew or their cousin, and the guy's panicked. Well, I just don't want my kids to catch it. I don't want them to catch it. I don't want this to catch it. I don't want them to catch it. And I said, have you educated yourself? Have you read up on it? Have you done the studies and the research? They're saying right now, two-thirds of people who catch it do what? Recover. Matter of fact, the most people prone to dying from it are 65 and older and those who have pre-existing conditions. Which means, if you know anything about pre-existing conditions, you shouldn't even catch the flu. Why? Because that'll kill you too. But what we have is we have a spirit of panic. That's why people are freaking out and going to Costco and just trying to raid the cabinets because we're panicked. Now, I'm not saying we don't live with common sense. I've never not said that. But we also don't live in panic. We find the radical middle. So, pastor, what do I do with the worry that plagues my soul? Well, how about we read our Bibles? Let's go here. Now, these are Jesus' words, not mine. So if he's your Lord and Savior, this is him talking to you. This is why I tell you to what? I'm sorry. He said to worry. Did I miss that? Is there a knot there? There's a knot? Okay. Look at your neighbor. Say knot. There you go. About what? About everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink. Well, let's throw another word there. Toilet paper. And then we'll do a comma. Or enough clothes to wear, is it life more than what? Food and your body more than what? Okay, look at this. Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more what? To him than what they are? Can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? No, none of this is going to add to your life. So what does it mean? Now is our time to show the world that we walk by faith and not by sight. Sight. 
faith. We walk by faith. So if your neighbor's sick, pray for him. Does your God heal or doesn't he heal? Hello? Put your faith out there. Didn't that what you prayed for? God, push me, stretch me while it's here. Don't be a closet Christian now. It's here. It's time to put up or it's time to hug the boat or what? Walk on water. We all pray for this. God, use me, use me. Now's your time. Now, now's the moment. This is what he's calling us to do. And then watch this, watch this. I love this next verse. I love it. Absolutely love it. Don't worry about, I'm sorry, that he meant some things, right? Don't worry about some things. What's the word again? Why? But pray about everything. Wow. God's word is so full of life. Isn't that amazing? He said, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. And watch this. Then you experience what? God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. Now, I love this. I love it. I love it. I love it. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, and here's where we're going to camp. Fix your thoughts on what is true. See, this is where I'm going to expose the enemy. And there are going to be some people who get upset. But that's fine. It's how I've lived my whole life. Here's the problem. You're not fixing your thoughts on, what are, on what's true. You're reading everything that's on a whim. If you weren't careful, you may have woke up to an article this morning that said they believe 1.5 million people are going to be infected. Let's go to what we know is true. You can't give me a single place in the world, not a single place, including China, where it originated, where there's 1.5 million people affected. Because why? Because there's not 1.5 million people affected right now, and that disease has been out since December. You didn't know that, did you? Also, do you know what neighbors China to the east? Taiwan. Taiwan currently right now only has 55 people infected, and that's their neighbor. Hello. You wouldn't know that. Because if you go to the CDC website, which I encourage you to do this, if you scroll down, they'll tell you people who are infected and presumed infected. That's why that number, if you check, I think they updated every three hours. If you check, the numbers will just keep dropping up and going down, going up, going down, going down, going up, going up, going down. Because they don't know. Once you take the test, they presume you're infected because you got a fever. Then they got to come back and go, oh, they didn't have it. We've even, we've even watched right now as they've counted people dead twice because they were in one state, but their driver's license was in a different state. You got to arm yourself with knowledge. You've got to, you've got to look for yourself. You got to stop reading everything people are posting. If you read that everybody's buying toilet paper, you're going to want to go out and buy toilet paper. <laughs> Watch this. Did you know where we get the majority of our rice from? Right here in California, up by Sacramento. Ah, let's go get rice. Why? They're going to grow more. That's what farmers do. It's like saying, let's go buy almonds. Why? Drive down the street. They're growing. We have tons. If anything, you need to buy beans in a can. They'll last for years. No expiration date. Trust me. I know. Twinkies. 10 years from now, they'll be fine. Everybody who wanted to eat healthy done blew it. Your kale will get moldy and go back into the earth. But that Twinkie, you can bury it and resurrect it, baby. It'll be good in 10 years. They, see, they, they had me all wrong. They had me all wrong. We got to fix our thoughts. We got to fix our thoughts. But pastor, I'm still concerned. Let's go back to the verse again. I'm still concerned. Don't worry about anything, but pray. You know, you know what worry is? 
Worry is you trying to control a situation you can't control. It's paying interest on something that's occupying your mind. Because you can't do nothing with it. But Jesus said the antidote to worry is prayer. So God, I'm just hoping you would give me wisdom. God, I'm hoping that you would open up a door of opportunity. God, I hope that you find a cure. God, I hope that you do this. God, that I hope that you do what? Because what you're saying is I'm not in control, but God is in control. He gives us the remedy for the worry so that we can what? Fix our thoughts. Now, pastor, does that mean we just live any way we want to? Absolutely not. Let me tell you what I think we should do. Wash your hands. That's a great place to start. I'm going to help you one. Take a shower. <laughs> Use soap. It's all the 14-year-old boys who don't do that yet. Use soap. <laughs> Shampoo. Clean behind your ears. How many of you know what I'm talking about? This is good, this is good wisdom. Right? How about this? If someone is sick, tell them stay home. Which, isn't that what we used to do? Hey, you're sick? Don't come in. Stay home until you get well. If you have a fever, you already know. Until your fever breaks, don't go around nobody. You're contagious. I mean, we just got to get back to being good neighbors. Neighbors. I also put this, I also put this in, in my notes. Let's be cognitive and cognizant of those who are more fragile around us. If we look at what's happening, it's the older folk in the community. So let's use good old-fashioned common sense. Let's make sure we're taking care of them. And we can do that by being practical about the things we are doing. Now, the biggest concern, and this is what I've heard from parents, is what about my kids? To date, no kids have caught the virus. 19 and under, we don't, they don't know, this is the funny part, they don't know why. They have no answers. Trust me, I've Googled it. No answers. And if you're in good shape and you're under the age of 30, three days. Three days is all they say at last. Three days. I had the flu for like 15. I mean, it was crazy. I'm not going to tell you who got me sick, but he's in the building, so it's his fault. But, <laughs> but my point is, we need to use good old-fashioned common sense so we get worried about our kids. So, hey, keep your kids close then. Keep them close. It's all good. They got, the home, they got the longest spring break ever. That's all I got to say right now. I never had a four-week spring break. That was called summer vacation. And that meant work, pulling weeds, mowing lawns. Well, that's a good idea. That's what we'll do. We'll pull weeds and mow lawns. So you need to fix your thoughts on what is true. Now watch this. I'm going to throw a little plot twist. Worship team, go ahead and come on up. I'm going to throw a little plot twist. <sighs> I want to think about how to say this because this could get me in some trouble. <laughs> oh, what the heck. So <laughs> I was thinking about this in a interesting sort of way. You're all taking a Sabbath. You're taking a Sabbath, which just by rule of thumb, most Americans don't do. But this thing, COVID-19, by the way, that just stands for coronavirus 2019, because it was found last year. Somebody said, there's been 19 strands. There hasn't. It's just the year that it started, but there have been other, there have been other coronaviruses. That's true. Now listen, in an interesting sort of way, God has gotten us to slow down. Listen to me. Families are eating dinner together. Families are staying in the house together. I don't know too many people working overtime. And really, our prayers should be for another group of people as well. Our first responders, our nurses, our doctors, those who are gonna come to the aid of those who are sick, who are putting their lives on the line. And I'm sitting here thinking to myself, the Lord has got us to slow down. Now, somebody say, were you going to say the Lord caused the virus? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying he's using it to get us to slow down. Maybe, maybe we took some things for granted, like each other. Maybe we haven't appreciated each other as much. 
So you can take anything that's coming at you and you can turn your situation positive. So maybe it's time that we have a couple meals together. Maybe it's time that we do knock on the neighbor's door and say, hey, you ain't going nowhere, I ain't going nowhere, why don't you come on over? Maybe we could take the stones that the enemy's throwing at us, we could build an altar and we could worship the Lord. Maybe what we could do is we could be the church come tomorrow, come Monday, by allowing the world to see that we're walking in faith. So that means we can't invite people over. That means we can when they say, why aren't you panicked? Because I serve a God who conquered panic. Why aren't you worried? Because I serve a God who says to cast all my worry aside and give it to him. Why? Because I don't live for me. Church, let me give you the truth of the matter. This too shall pass. It's going to pass. It's going to pass. And there's still going to be stuff to work on. Like your marriage that's in a rough spot. Like your personal life that's still not doing well. There's still going to be stuff that needs to be done. Some of us are still going to have kids who are graduating. We're still going to have kids who are going on to the next grade. You follow where I'm going with this? So why don't we allow this opportunity to hit the pause button and work on a few things. Maybe it's time to get friends together. Maybe it's time to call family members that we've been distant from and make amends. Maybe it's time to offer and dish out forgiveness. Let go of offenses. Really begin to love again. The church was built to respond in moments like these. The church was built to challenge believers to go be the church not on Sunday, but the church on Monday. The church was built, why? Because the church offers a hope that God can heal, offers a hope that God can provide, offers a hope that God can comfort, offers a hope that God can save your soul, and offers a hope that death, hell, and the grave have been defeated once and for good, for all. In this time where fear is running just rampant, may the world look to the church and realize we've got a fearless response to a fearful world. So, we've taken precautions. All of our services, as long as they're going to allow us to meet, we're going to continue to meet. We're going to continue to get together because this is, for some people, this is going to be a refuge. We're going to take extra good care of wiping down stuff, sanitizer wipes, everything. So we've reduced our services to about 50 minutes so our teachers can clean the classrooms extra thoroughly. We're taking everything we know how to do. Why? Because we are going to use good common sense, but as we pray and believe in faith. Because I said it before and I'll say it again. When this all pans out, when it all turns the page, I want the world to see that we kept going. That we, that we kept the lights on, the doors open. Now I'm believing. I'm believing the devil's throwing everything he can, including the kitchen sink at us. He's trying to get us to where we can't celebrate Easter. Wouldn't he like to shut Easter down? Wouldn't he like to shut it down? But I'm prophesying and I'm believing that we will go on with Easter as normal, that we'll be in the Tower Theater for Easter, that we'll probably have to do four services, but we'll do all four. We'll preach all four. We'll pray over all four. But I'm believing that God is, that God is going to throw a haymaker and we're going to make a way possible. That is what we just sang. My God is what? A miracle worker, right? He's a way maker. He is light in the darkness. Church, I think now is not a time to retreat, but now is the time to let faith rise. And I'm believing and I'm prophesying that this is our greatest hour, that this is the time the church can do something. Can you stand to your feet? Can we just make a bold declaration? If you're watching online, go ahead and just pray and believe with us. 
that our God is greater, our God is stronger. But Father, in the name of Jesus, we are believing that you are turning the page, that the best days are ahead of us yet, that you are doing something so supernatural. We give you all the praise and glory, church. Shout amen.